Welcome everyone. I have an interesting topic today that I want to present to you all and I have my friend Daniel in the house that's going to really explain this, what's called survivorship life insurance. That's titled this video today and the, and the main topic for today's discussion. I really don't know a whole lot about this. So I'm thanking you in advance, Daniel, to you know present this to me and my clients. And what we're going to be diving into is really what is it? How does it work? And then what are the parameters? Who does this make most sense for? And why should we even be you know, paying attention to something like this uh, when, when predominantly most people on this channel are, are doing velocity banking, they're accelerating their debt, they're paying off debt, they're increasing cash flow, they're building their credit, they're increasing their access to capital, then they're funding whole life insurance policy for the, the, the tax-free benefits, the death benefits, and things like that. So I know immediately they're going to be a little confused because they're like, okay, does my whole life insurance do survivorship or is it a, a totally different policy that I'd be buying and how does it you know, add to what I'm already doing? So that's just giving you the context of who you're talking to and predominantly people that are practicing debt elimination plus they're funding these overfunded whole life insurance contracts plus they have a desire to get into real estate and, and invest in properties rental and they're trying to create lifetime income lifetime cash flow. Then they're also cash learning from you uh, and you've been serving quite a few of my clients on how they're taking some of those assets and then rolling, you know, lump sum amounts out of their 401ks, IRAs, retirement accounts, and they're rolling over lump sum into annuities that you've been educating my audience on as well. So they're doing that. And now you're going to throw this on us, which sounds really <laughs> cool. So... It's awesome. Wherever yeah. You, wherever you like to begin, help us out here. Help me help me understand. Sure. Absolutely. Denzel, thanks so much for that. I really appreciate it. I am fired up about survivorship life insurance right now. I'm so excited because yes, I do get the benefit of serving a lot of people every week. A lot of people you've sent over and a lot of my own clients and other and other people I get to take uh, time with. So I, I I'm with a lot of different families every single week. And I get to see a lot of different circumstances and a lot of different people's priorities and their needs and what they want to accomplish. And one thing I really pride myself on is I'm always looking for that little edge. I want to find something that's really special and meaningful that'll help serve them and help them accomplish their goals and meet their objectives. And I think survivorship life doesn't get talked about enough. And so I want to be someone that came on and shares this with everybody because the interest rate environment has had a massive impact on insurance products in a really positive way. I just worked through a decade of basically no interest rates. And now that we're here and we've seen interest rates go up so fast, so quickly, um, it's had just a, a tremendous, tremendous impact on what we get to do to serve people. And it's made these, these products really exciting. And survivorship life is definitely one that I'm most, maybe not most, but very, very excited about. Because survivorship life is really a way where an insurance company can insure two lives. Another way to say survivorship life is also called second to die. So with traditional life insurance, you know, you're used to having a death benefit and when the insured passes, the death benefit is paid. Well, when an insurance company can insure two lives, mortality costs go down, they can actually provide, in most cases, a much larger substantial death benefit when you're insuring two lives and both people have to pass. So a lot of people might right there be kind of confused and go, well, why is that a benefit? Like, how is that good? Well, that's one thing I love doing on YouTube is kind of helping people to create frameworks to think of life insurance differently. A lot of people try to figure out life insurance and they go, okay, I figured out term. And then maybe they watch some, you know, videos like this. They go, okay, I think I got whole life down or I got IUL down, you know, and then someone comes on like me and I start talking about survivorship life. And so then it gets kind of confusing. It's like, wait, that doesn't make any sense. Why are you trying to get more death benefit? I thought we were trying to build more cash value. What's really important to distinguish is what are you using your life insurance for and what needs can it really serve? Like you mentioned in the intro, Denzel, if people are building up cash values to then take loans and put into the real estate or whatever they're going to do with it, that's a totally different use case for life insurance than what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about with survivorship life is we want to be putting in money, not building a cash value and trying to leverage as much death benefit as we can for that premium. 
So in my mind, with somebody who uses life insurance a lot and owns a lot of life insurance, I think of those as almost like completely opposite type strategies, right? One, you're trying to overfund and get a lot of cash into so you can use it. The other, you're trying to put as little amount as, as you can to get as much death benefit. It's almost similar to like term insurance. You know, when you go to buy a term policy, you're trying to say, okay, well, how can I get the most benefit with the, the best company I can find for the cheapest premium? Right? That's what everybody's shopping for. Right. Survivorship life insurance is the same, except survivorship life insurance can be with you for life. It's not like a term where you're going to get it for 10, 20, 30 years. This is going to be something that you're going to pay in. And if you structure it properly, you'll have it for your entire life. And so what's exciting about survivorship life is it could be whole life. It could be universal life, index universal life, guaranteed universal life. I typically use the SGUL, Survivorship Guaranteed Universal Life. And the reason I use that is because when we're buying death benefits, I don't want really performance to have that big of an impact on it. In some cases, having performance can be a really good thing. But for what I'm going to talk about today, I just want to go to the company and say, okay, company, for this premium, for this client's age, you know, what will you guarantee the death benefit to? And you can pick an age, you know, it's going to be like 105 or 120. And so when we can do that, we can create some really good certainty and the leverage you can create right now is very exciting. So I'll give you a couple of examples before I do. Do you have any questions? Yeah. What was the S A G part? What was that again? I'm going to S U L survivorship guaranteed universal life S V U L uh, G I'm sorry. G like golf. Okay, S G U L. Yep. And that stands for Survivor Guaranteed Universal, Universal Life. Life. Yep. Okay. Which is you know, whole life, but with the index option in there. Is that what I'm Well, about? actually, that's a good question. So this is where it gets confusing. I want to break this down. So you can have survivorship whole life. Okay. You can have survivorship index universal life, but this is its own. This is survivorship guaranteed universal life. And mm -hmm. basically what that means is you pay a premium, the company's going to give you a guarantee to a certain age. That's it. There's no performance. There's no inner, you know, it does have an interest rate that they assess and apply to it. Yeah. But when you, when you set up a guaranteed universal life policy, you just basically pick a guarantee age. And as long as you pay that exact premium on time, they're just going to provide that death benefit up to that age. So that's why we'll usually choose like 120 or like, you know, one, 105, because that's generally going to be pretty safe for most people. <laughs> so the higher you go in age, the better? Well, it, it can cost more to go higher in age, depending uh, on the company and how they, and how, what they, what they consider their, uh, you know, guarantee age to be. Some companies will guarantee it to like a hundred and that counts as 120. Some yeah. companies you can pay a little more to get it to 120. So you get to choose, but yeah, I mean, it really depends on, um, realistically the client's needs. Yeah. And if, if the, um, you know, if you, if you feel like 120 is the safest route, then you can go to 120. And basically what that means is you're going to get that death benefit guaranteed to age 120 from the company. Okay. And the premium that I'm paying mm -hmm. is, um, a, a premium I pay every year for a period of time yep. or yeah, okay. you can set it up just like other life insurance where you can pay annually, monthly, you could do one payment. Um, you could do 10 payments and then have it paid up. I mean, you could, you could do it really any way you so, want. So there's um, which, a, lot of, a lot of flexibility here, just depending on person's cash flow, right? Yep. Depending so, on their cash flow and their needs. Got it. Is there, cause specific to this audience here, is there a type of maybe template that generally speaking, we could rely on when they're looking at their numbers or they're like, okay, I'm, I'm paying off debt right now, Daniel. I'm also. Yep funding this life insurance overfunded whole life that I did with mm -hmm. you or Caleb or Denzel or Steve Parisi. And so yep. I'm funding this policy, I already have cash flow going to these departments. Is there a percentage of cash flow or percentage of their annual gross income yeah. that you kind of make a correlation as to how much we should be or could potentially be funding this type of policy? Is there some kind of template there? I love, I love that question. And I love the way your mind works. <laughs> um, the, the answer is the template is going to be dictated based on the needs we're trying to ensure. So let me give you an example of that. This is, this yeah. is, I think my answer your question right here. 
let's go to your real estate investing clients, right? They want to invest in real estate. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, a lot of people want to build a real estate empire and build cash flowing assets and then hold those assets forever and let them cash flow and then leave them to their heirs. And let's say you end up leaving them to three children. Okay. Let's say two of those children are super interested in what you did to build wealth. They're mirroring your principles. They want to take over the real estate. They want to grow it. They want to be a part of it. Let's say one child's like, it, you know, and no offense to artists, but let's say they're just maybe a little more free spirited. They want to go do something completely different than maybe the family real estate portfolio. Okay. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. Just as an example. Well, survivorship life insurance can provide the estate liquidity to basically buy out that heir so that the other two could just inherit the entire real estate portfolio and keep it in alignment with what their values are and where they want to build their wealth. So, you know, in that example, you might look at a family and say, okay, well, what's the projection of this real estate going to be? Okay, how could we, you know, set up a policy where we could specifically designate it to go to one of the beneficiaries and they can basically use that to buy out um, that beneficiary so they can take over the real estate instead of having to liquidate assets to get them their portion. So God. where some families get into trouble is they might build really successful businesses. They might uh, build a lot of different, you know, asset classes like real estate. Um, and then when it comes time for the estate to be distributed, you know, maybe those beneficiaries don't agree on what they want to see happen. Or maybe one of them says they're in a different position and they go, look, I want my money right now, or I need my money right now. Well, having some estate liquidity can be really, really important so that it doesn't disrupt everything that that family built and worked for and interrupts the compounding of that generational wealth. So survivorship life is a very economical way to solve that problem. You can designate a, what I would argue a relatively small amount of premium to get a very large benefit. What people don't know about survivorship life until they see it, they're often shocked at how little they have to put in to get a lot of death benefit that's going to actually be there when they pass. So let me give you an example, like somebody in their seventies, you know, they could put in just, I'm just using kind of ballpark numbers here, but you know, somebody in their seventies, if they were putting in, let's say 12 grand a year into survivorship life, it's possible right now with the types of things that are available, they could be going out and getting somewhere in the neighborhood of 750, 900,000 of death benefit. That's going to be wow. locked in and actually pay their heirs. So another great use case for it is for people who want to liberate themselves to enjoy their retirement to the fullest. Okay. So before because, you go into that, before you go into that yeah. first, I uh, just have it on. Is it a proper way of saying, uh, for the first case use with the kids, proper family distribution? Is that like a sure. good example of what you just said, like summarizing? that first case use. Absolutely. It could be, okay. it could be really used really well there. Definitely. That's how I understood that in that e and example there. So proper family distribution is saying, yeah, I'm, I'm Denzel Rodriguez. I'm this content creator. I spend the next 40, 50 years building a massive YouTube channel. Yeah. I have two or three kids. One of them yeah. wants to be, like you said, like an artist. The other yeah. two want to uh, perpetuate dad's mission of being a finance geek and then both kids want to be finance geeks and they want to keep going in dad's direction yeah. but when i pass away I, let's say i want to equally give each kid the same amount of wealth but yeah, yeah. this this child wants really nothing to do with dad's business yeah. they want to do their own thing but still have the wealth of what I built, yeah. but in order for him to get that wealth, there's got to be some kind of liquidation. How do you liquidate a YouTube channel, right? That's right. bringing in <laughs> cash flow. How do you how do you liquidate the assets that I've been able to build? All the affiliate referral partnerships. Those yeah. two other kids are really going to reap more of the benefit because they're working in the company. So now yeah. maybe they're getting a, a stream of income. The way I set up the trust that if they, you know, do X, Y, and Z, you're going to get these kinds of payouts. But this kid is like, no, that's not my purpose. You know, God called me to do this. Yeah. But now he's kind of like, he or she is kind of like not having the, the capital to maybe go yeah. and, and do that. Whereas the other two kids have a bigger advantage. So you're saying in my case with SGUL, let's say the type of survivorship 
life insurance leveraging myself and mom let's say the youtube channel is is creating lifetime income spread out between the three kids of ten thousand a month so each kid would be getting ten thousand a month let's just say that would be the the proper distribution the third would get the life insurance put into the say my trust and mm -hmm. that life insurance could supplement that split of say 33 and a third percent yeah yeah and now that death benefit is let's just say for example paying them ten thousand a month that that they can have and it buys out their 33 and a, and a third share of dad's company that's yeah, that's yeah. yeah okay that i've never thought of that and yeah. That again, for those that are watching, this is a totally different strategy than our whole life, our velocity banking, our, you know, our first lien HELOCs, everything in there is the world of accumulation, reduce interest costs, maximize cash flow efficiency, stewardship, right? Liquidity to be able to use while living. This is in this example is more of what happens after death and how do we perpetuate the kingdom without having to liquidate the asset to make sure all the kids get equal share of of the company because again how do you liquidate a business without selling it right where now the two kids have to maybe reduce their shares of their distribution in order to in order to buy out the other kid that doesn't want to build the business something like that right, right. so i think that's well yeah you either got to sell it or leverage it and then think about leverage. what kind of stress that puts on this next Correct. generation now they have a huge right. loan against their business right. Mm -hmm. right i mean that's stressful right so you can just do leverage the other way just buy a survivorship policy and make sure that goes to the family this is a huge problem for wealthy families uh on the back side like that people don't yeah. think about is distribution and so that's it it, it can also be for taxes too like okay, think about just like if they owe a um, substantial amount of tax, this is a great way to be able to, you know, set up something where you can, I mean, when you do this level, you have to get an attorney involved. Yeah. You know, you have to use special trusts, but you know, you can use it for, um, it, it all falls under that category of proper family distribution planning. Okay. So case use number two is taxes. Covering taxes. taxes would be, and, and yeah. And that's kind of like, maybe not its own case study. It's maybe more like, you know, like, a, yeah, kind of under use case one, right? It could be for taxes yeah. or for family members that want to be liquidated or for specific needs that are supposed to be met as well. Mm -hmm. You know, there's there's a lot you can do with it. Okay, so I'll put that under under one. So what was number two? So, um, yeah, number two is going to be for people who really want to maximize the fulfillment of their retirement while living while living. You know, you have a lot of families that end up in this kind of tug of war. And I see this all the time. And it's really hard to think about or really have perspective on how this feels until you're in it. I see it all the time. So I get to see it firsthand and I think about it a lot. And then I get the, to practice. OK, well, how are they feeling and what would that be like if let's say you're in your mid 60s? or 70s and you've accumulated some wealth and now you have kids you might have grandkids or you might just be in a place where you're thinking about how much time do you have left on earth and how much good time do you have left on earth where you can actually do things and enjoy life not you know be in a place where you're confined maybe you're disabled right these are real 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 dilemmas that people think about all the time and so when you get to that point you don't want to have a tug of war especially between spouses where one spouse is like, and, and this is very common, hey, we should be spending more, we should be enjoying more, we only have so much time, look at our neighbors, yep. you know, we wanna go visit our grandkids, let's do the family cruise we talked yep. about. Comparison. And the other spouse is like, uh, you know, I'm not quite ready to do that, I don't know if we can do that, mm -hmm. right? And because maybe they don't feel like they have enough and they need to have some better conversations around how to create the right tools to provide cash flow to make sure that they're gonna be comfortable and all their needs are met and all the risks are taken care of. But it also a lot of times is because they kind of want to leave their kids something. They want legacy, right? That's what it comes down to. It's, a, it's about your legacy. So, you know, they want to leave their kids and grandkids something, leave them better off. 
make sure they get an inheritance. Well, how do you do that? You can just be intentional with the amount you want to leave them with survivorship life. You can say, okay, what would make me feel fulfilled? What would make sure that my legacy is honored and they're going to have a great head start for their business, their life, their retirement? Maybe my grandkids will get college education out of it. What's that number that I want to make sure they leave? You can just pick that number with SGUL. You can just go, okay, look, I got two kids. I have four grandkids. I want to make sure they get a million dollars. Great. I'm going to carve off maybe, you know, 1% or 2% of my interest from this account. That's going to fund the SGUL. They're going to get that million dollars. And guess what that does for us now? Now that opens a different kind of conversation. You can put that fear and rest to bed. They're going to get that money. Now you can liberate some of those other assets to spend and enjoy with them and make memories and not just focus on the financial part. I see. So in your example there on the, on the, if we use that same one from earlier about you know, yeah. someone in their seventies, 12 K yep. a year, let's just say, and they get anywhere from like seven to 900,000 in death benefit. Sure. Um, touch on, I feel like I missed it. And I feel like others that are watching probably missed it as well. But maximizing sure. retirement while living, it sounded like we went into dying again. For, yeah, like, like, but that's, that's that. No, that's the that's the tug of war that happens, right? People don't spend their assets because they want to leave them to their kids. So another a way to solve that would be, OK, let's just pick a benefit we want to give our kids or our okay. grandkids. And what we'll do is we'll fund that with leverage meaning we can take small premiums to get a lot of death benefit. And that death benefit will be specifically what goes to the kids. That puts to bed that tug of war, that need to want to make sure that you're holding assets to give them. And you can now spend those assets and enjoy those assets with them. The other assets, not this itself, not the life. Right, exactly. Itself. Okay, yeah, so that's where example, I got a little confused. Okay. Yeah, so in my example, I'm saying, okay, let's say you've built some wealth and you want to leave some of that to your kids, a lot of people think you have to leave them the money or you have to leave them those assets. You don't. You can take interest from those assets, leave them a big amount of life insurance, and then that liberates a lot of those assets for you to use and spend and enjoy and, 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 and spend while, with them. While living. So while assuming, living. So assuming, let's say, a client of mine has five to seven you know, rental properties, they got their they got their social security pension, maybe annuities, um, yep, yep. retirement accounts, right? That they're living off of now. Yep, yep. And then they're wondering how much longer can I do this, so to speak. Yep, and yep. you're saying by taking a percentage of that 401k retirement account or a percentage of the cash flow from the real estate and just use your insurability at that age, whatever you qualify mm -hmm. for to get a maximum death benefit, leveraging yep, yep. both parents, mom and dad, let's just say. Yep, yep, yep. And it's like, now that that's there, that, that, that 900 grand, that million dollar death benefit that I want to just, the number that I pick that I want to leave, mm -hmm. that set, if I want to liquidate an asset, sell off a property of my seven, let's just say, yep, yep more than happy to do so I, do, I don't have that stress of worrying that if i sell this asset if i if i drain this if i pull more from the 401k that i'm not going to have anything left to pass on especially for right. the believers that are watching that really take to heart the idea of leaving an inheritance for your children's children that concept of legacy that you want to fulfill that Right. Yes. yes. Um, biblically speaking, for those that have that faith and even those that don't, but just logically, they want to leave money behind. They want to leave their kids better off than what their parents left them, that sort of thing. Uh, you're, you're saying that when it comes to, like you said, when you get to 70s and 60s and I'm witnessing it more with clients, their mm -hmm. fear, because no one ever ran the numbers with them on, on actually projecting how long this money would last and not just hoping for a safe rate of return or something like that. That's just almost cookie cutter, not actually running the numbers and they still have this fear and now their anxiety, their blood pressure's up, their cholesterol's through the roof, their, you know, different things are out of whack. And it's mm -hmm. like, no, you did a great job. You actually saved, you invested, you stewarded your money. You've got a million, two million in overall net worth, but there's still this, this fear 
either spouse wants to spend more, husband wants to spend less, or husband wants to spend more, wife wants to spend less, because they're both thinking the same, right? But yeah. they're processing it differently. And they're just overall stressed when they really shouldn't be in their 70s, and that's how you die faster, stress. And, yeah. and it's like, wait a minute, guys. You know, we spent our whole lives accumulating wealth. How do we, in a, in a stress-free way, spend this money? Use it, right? Live life to the fullest, like they say. Yeah, yeah. But also practically be mindful of unique ways of, of leveraging small percentage of what those investments are producing, as you said. So that sounded like a template for me, which was based off of a percentage of what you're already producing yeah, and yeah. not thinking how much more money do I have to come up with to pay this bill? hundred percent. Right? I think that's a big, that's uh, huge. A, a gem right there for me mm -hmm. that I got, which was, I was already processing, okay, in my own expenses, how much more money do I need to create? How much more income to pay this bill? Because that's how many of us treat our life insurance policies as a bill that needs to be paid versus how can, your other investments feed this other asset that ultimately is going to give you a, a greater return over everything, right? Especially when we die. And then again, while we're living, case study, uh, case use number two is really touching on uh, maximizing your retirement, assuming watching those watching have other assets. I would right. be willing to bet here that if someone doesn't have a whole lot of assets, maybe this doesn't quite make sense because maybe they still need to kind of build to create the the lifetime income and then have some sort of, you know, death benefit afterwards. You know, if they already have whole life or other, you know, terms or things like that, then maybe they'd be okay. Correct me if I'm wrong here. But yep, yep. and then uh how is it funded? So one template is just a you know, one idea is a percentage of other assets so from the profits right denzel you always segue, segue me so well i want to talk about idea number three <laughs> all right let's do it okay so but before we move on i just want to make sure it's really clear exactly what you just said if if you if you're in a place where you're in retirement and you have other assets and you're feeling like oh i i want to leave my heirs something so i don't want to spend too much but I also want to make memories with them and I want to spend more that solved. This is what solves it. Yes. You can just specifically say, let me go get a 10 pay, 20 pay life pay, whatever, you know, and let's name the inheritance. Okay. A mm -hmm. long time ago, my dad talked about naming your money. Okay. We're going to name your inheritance. This, this is going to be what it, what is for now it's built and now we get to enjoy. I like that. Name your inheritance, name your inheritance. I like that a lot actually. And does the death benefit increase if I'm doing like a 10 pay, let's say, or something like that? Like after the, the premiums are done, does the death benefit go up? Well, that's where whole life and index universal life structured as survivorship can actually have some benefits mm. that we didn't even touch on. Right. So this could be like three videos because yeah. even when I get case study number three, we're not going to be able to get to like when you structure them for cash values because they have a lot of value there as well. Um, so we might have to do this as like a two-parter, but um, you know, you can actually build in increasing death benefits over time with survivorship life if you use one of those other structures. The SGUL is again in that opposite realm where you're not looking for it to perform or to grow. You're just saying, okay, I'm going to pick this, this amount of money and I'm going to get this benefit. And but what you said was so wise because a lot of it is a paradigm shift for people. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're thinking of this as life insurance as like another bill, like, oh, here we go, I gotta put money into something, then you're not gonna be able to get the benefits out of it and you utilize it to help actually create that fulfillment or maybe even that efficiency that you're, you're missing out on right now. When you look at it, and this leads me right into case study number three is people that sell rental properties when they're ready to retire. I, I do this all the time. People will sell a property that's cash flowing because now they're in their 70s and they just don't want to deal with the tenant. They don't want calls anymore. 
you know, they call it, what is it, tenants, uh, termites, toilets. They don't want to deal with, you know, any of the problems that come along with rentals. So when you're in your 20s, 30s, 40s, you know, not a big deal. You're dealing with stuff all the time. That's just life. You know, you get call in the middle of the night. You got to fix something. You got to make an adjustment. It's much more, it's easier to handle at a different phase in life. When you're in your 70s and things change, you go, I just don't want to mess with it. They want to sell. Well, they want to have something similar to what they have when they have the rental. They want cash flow. Well, how do you get cash flow? There's a lot of different ways you can get cash flow. A lot of times though, if they're looking for safety, they're going to be looking at fixed rate products, bank CDs, fixed annuities, something where you're going to get a fixed rate and you're going to keep your principal safe. Well, that can be good in a high interest rate environment like right now, or a relatively higher than what we're used to, right? You can go to the bank or a fixed annuity company and go get four or 5% keep the principal safe, take the interest off the top. That's what they're really looking for, right? But could you do better? Well, what we've been doing a lot of lately is, okay, somebody sells a property. Now let's say they have $400,000 and let's say they're in their seventies. You can put that $400,000 into a joint lifetime income annuity. And depending on their age and the company you select, that immediate payout could be as high as let's say 9%, okay? Now they're going to get a 9% payout of that money for life. Well, that's good, but it doesn't really solve their problem because now they're just going to spend through that money. Yes, they're, the company's going to give them that certainty that they're going to get that 9% distribution for as long as they live, but it doesn't take a, a mathematician to realize they're going to spend through all their money pretty quick. Most of the time before they end up, you know, reaching life expectancy. So that doesn't leave anything left over for the kids. It doesn't honor that goal of keeping that principal to pass on. Right, because well, the annuity will reduce over time, right? That 400K. So yep, yep. there may not be anything left over to pass on, right? Probably, there probably won't be. At that yeah. high of a distribution in your 70s, there's a high probability that, you know, they're going to get their money's worth with that annuity. They're going to get a lot of those payments. But yeah, there won't be anything left for the, for so, the beneficiary. So where are you going with that example? The joint lifetime income annuity, are you about to say, well, part of that distribution could pay for an SGUL. Is that where you're going with that? Or? That's where I'm going with that. So, uh, okay. so, so, let's, <laughs> so let's say, let's say you carve off, let's say like, you know, one and a half percent or 2%. Well, if you carve off one and a half or 2% of that payment, you're definitely going to be able to replace that 400,000 with an SGUL. Really? So now what you've done is instead of going and being at the mercy of interest rates and fixed rate products at four or 5% that, you know, maybe might go down and you have interest rate risk and all of a sudden you're at a race to the bottom again, right? This is what happens with people who buy CDs and fixed annuities. They want the highest rate they can get with a good quality company. But then when interest rates start trending downward, now when their renewals are coming up, okay, a year's gone by, what's available? Well, now instead of getting a rate at 5%, you can get a rate at four and a half. So they buy that. And then in two years and the rates go down again, you see where I'm going with this, right? Mm -hmm. You can actually have a diminishing cash flow with that strategy. If you pair the right type of lifetime joint lifetime income annuity up with the right type of survivorship life, you can create potentially higher cash flow and still honor that goal of leaving that money intact to past your heirs. Okay. So at, at say 400 K that was a joint lifetime in, in, income annuity. Husband yep. and wife at nine percent, this so thirty six thousand a year. Yep. yep. Right. You're saying take one percent or or one point five percent of yep. the nine. Let's so, let's just call it two percent. Let's take two percent. So eight grand. Okay. So eight grand of the thirty six now pays for say that S S G U L. Yep. Yep. And that would get me. Let's say this person is is seventy. Right. And 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 let's say the wife is. 68, right? Okay. So kind of close in eight. Roughly estimate here. How much death yeah. benefit does 8K get me? I mean, it totally depends on their age and their rating, but let's just in this example say that, you know, we, we won't give them any type of, you know, I'm not running any illustrations, you just ballparks, but let's just say like around 400,000. We'll, we'll just call it 400,000 for this example to keep it simple. Okay. It could be like, more, it could be less. I was going to say, that, sounds, that definitely sounds like an underestimation if we come over here at the 70s and 12 i got them seven to nine so i'd say it would definitely yeah i want to be more conservative in this yeah, example it's probably going to be it's probably going to be more but just for this example i want to keep it simple so people yeah. can see the replacement of the yeah, yeah cool so 400k death benefit both have to pass away for the kids to get that yep yep 
right? If husband passes away before wife, wife is still getting the annuity, right? Still getting the income. Still getting the income. So that so her lifestyle doesn't change. Mm-hmm. Um, but upon death, we need to make sure that there's some kind of, you know, income there to kind of cover, you know, barrel expenses and things like that. So maybe there's a separate policy that handles that. Um, yep, yep. But in let's just say they were good there. This eight grand gets them this. And do I pay eight grand forever or would it be multiple payments like a 10 pay? Could a 10 pay potentially do that? Solve for that? You could, you could do it with the 10 pay. You'd probably have to put in more to get that amount of leverage if you did a 10 pay, like a, a good amount more. But um, in this example, it would be a life pay because. Okay, so these, lifetime. Yeah, until, these are like. Until puzzle they pass. Pieces. Yeah, so think of them like two puzzle pieces, right? You have the joint lifetime income annuity that's going to provide cash flow for life. And you have the joint survivorship life policy that needs a premium for life. So yeah. when you put those two together, you skim off the extra cash flow. That's how we were able to significantly boost the amount of cash flow this person was getting. And again, there's a lot of assumptions here, right? You got to assume that we're not doing this with all of someone's money. This is just like one piece of their portfolio, right? Like if they own seven properties exactly. and we sell one and, and there's 400,000, well, maybe this is you know a good move for this one. Um, and that's kind of what we're talking about. So that's where you're able to boost cash flow. And we're only taking 2% of that distribution, assuming they'd still be cash flow positive, right? Let's just say that was the case. And right, it right. still got them an additional four, even though they're spending the four while living. Yeah, yeah. So they just turned four into eight, right? For a lifetime mm-hmm. payment of 8K. And with the lifetime pay, the death benefit stays the same? It stays the it stays same. same. Cool. Got it. So right. that's where you look at it. Okay, if you if you have somebody who was used to getting a cap rate of like 5% and now they have this money and they want to do something kind of equivalent, yes, they're going to miss out on the appreciation of the real estate, right? Because the life insurance policy is not going to appreciate, but they're going to get a higher cash flow. <laughs> so again, it comes down to your priorities. You can maneuver this like a lever. Let's say they go, well, I don't need that much cash flow. I'm used to getting five. Great. Put more in the SGUL. Now you can get you can you can kind of mimic what appreciation might look like in the sense you'll be able to buy more death benefit than what you actually put in. So it, it depends on the client's needs, but that's yeah. what gets exciting when you start to put these things together. It's like, wow, you can create great cash flows, you can create great legacy, and you can do it all using products where you don't have to rely on performance for it to happen. You can just go to the company and say, give me your guarantee. Mm-hmm. I don't have to look at assumptions. I don't have to guess or wonder or worry yeah. or put in more money. It's just going to happen. Yeah. And that's what's nice if you use a good quality company and structure it properly. And, and so to wrap things up parameter wise, this yeah. type of strategy makes sense for people above what, 60 plus, 50 plus? I mean, it really depends. Like if you think about it and you're really like proactive in your wealth building journey, it's kind of like, you know, if you're, if you are younger, it's like putting your money where your mouth is. Like all these people will talk about wanting to be super successful and build these empires. Okay, well, you know, are, are your actions mapping, like matching that? Are you ensuring that future growth that you're going to assume you're going to make, you know? And so for some entrepreneurs, they might be, or people who are just growth mindset might be, you know, wise to actually look at this a little earlier than 60s because they may be on a pretty good trajectory. I and see. so because the younger some, you are, the cheaper the cost of insurance is. So you're saying I can, um, and, and Chris Kirkpatrick from Life 180, shout out to him. I think he talks a lot about, uh, as well as Caleb, ensuring yeah. ensuring your insurability early, like maximizing, getting as yeah. much death benefit for as little cost as you can now through either convertible term, or maybe there's a scenario where this also can make sense. And yeah, if, I'm sure some companies, um, you know, if the payment's low, then yeah. then just create more income because you're in your accumulation stage. You're still you know proactive, making more money. Yeah. Um, yeah. This sounds like a maximization tool for the person that's just coming across this information in their late sixties or mid seventies, and they're like, "Dude, how do I make the most out of this five hundred k?" You yeah, know, yeah. then it's great like for great. That. But for the person watching around my age, thirties, forties, you're still proactive, and we're willing to put away some some money, and we'll, we're still cash flow positive. You're saying this could work. This could still be quite valuable to 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 oh, look yeah. into. Okay. I think it's it's also, and I want to I want to make sure I'm clear on what I just said earlier. It's not just for like 
you know, super aggressive growth entrepreneur people. This is fantastic, maybe even better for people who don't want anything to do with that lifestyle. People who just want to make sure, hey, mm -hmm. we're very prudent, we're good savers, we're good investors, we put things away. It, it may be even better for that category of people who's like, I don't want the risk of entrepreneurship or real estate. I'd yeah. rather just kind of maybe, you know, like stick to more of a traditional thing that I'm comfortable with. But it is important that we do something special for our kids, our grandkids. We want legacy. Um, it, you know, it's really powerful. Like I got, I've gotten experiences firsthand so many times of families, um, you know, just intentionally dedicating funds to people they've never met yet. And like, that's legacy. Like, you know, a good example is um, my wife's grandfather passed several years ago. Mm -hmm. And when he passed, we found out that he had taken time to set up something in his trust where all of our kids would have something for college. He's, you know, some of us are still having kids in that side of the family. Like he's never, he never met them. He's never going to meet them, but you better believe that my wife and I are going to take time to educate our daughters on the man that he was and, you know, everything he did for them. That's like the power of legacy, right? That's what we're talking about. And that's something special that people can create in their own families. Uh, and they can do it with this as one of the tools. Wow. Very cool, man. Let's wrap it up here. This was really good. Sure. The action step now for those watching that want to just have a conversation around this, you feel like maybe this could work for you. Maybe it may be something else and you want to compare to what you're already doing. You know, yep. Daniel and his team, you reach out to them, jump on a call and they're willing to take that time to kind of measure these things out because um, Daniel, like myself, are not kind of like one way is the only way to do it. We, we love to make comparisons, run the numbers and even, you know, be wrong. Like, okay, you know, this was a thought, this, you know, could be, could be right. But according to the numbers, this makes more sense to, to do this according to just what we're seeing here. And then also basing it off your needs. So if you, if you like that style of approach when it comes to your finances not just kind of one way do it this way only but more so let's let's see what you're already thinking about client right mom dad husband wife let's see what you're already processing and let's run it through these different things that we just covered for for today so i think that'd be great anything else you'd like to share before we close out yeah i got one last thought anybody that is interested in taking some time and maybe kind of on the fence about scheduling some time with me one thing that's really important for me to express is like my mission is not to sell you survivorship life insurance. <laughs> like when I sit down with somebody, my agreement with Denzel, cause he's been gracious enough to have me on a few times. I work with a lot of his clients is my agreement with him is I'm going to try to put as much value around you as possible. So I really pride myself on our first call and just like learning as much as I can listening. And then I just try to give everything in that first call, like whatever I can identify, it might be a, a relationship. It might be an idea. It, it a lot of times has nothing to even do with me and what I do, but I'm just trying to give on those calls as much as I can. I think we've had a great response uh, from people that have taken me up on that. You know, there's no no cost for that. And we you know are happy to like that's my mission is to serve people and anybody that wants to take some time. Um, that's what we're going to try to do is we're not going to focus on. Now, if you want to spend our time talking about survivorship life, we can. But I'm really going to focus mostly on like what we can do to put the right people around you, the right tools around you and really help you further your mission. Uh, and that's what I wanna learn about from everybody. So I'd be, I'd be, I would love to take some time to do that. Awesome. So there you have it, folks. Uh, his link will be in the comment section below and in the description, also on my website. So reach out to Daniel and his team after watching this video. We also have a playlist together that we've been putting all this information in a, in a playlist for you. So you can go back and see some of our previous interviews. And you'll notice that we're kind of we're building from each video and we're doing yeah. case studies and really processing things so that you fully know what you're getting into. So by the time you get on a call, you know, you're all you're ready to go. Right. And yeah. we can make these moves and make the right moves, think legacy and so on and so on. So thank you, Daniel. Appreciate your time today. God bless you all. And we'll be talking soon.